Good afternoon. Welcome to this month's show. I'm Luke McCormack. During today's show, we will discuss best practices regarding IT modernization programs and strategies in the federal government. With me on today's show are Dr. Raj Ayer, Chief Information Officer, U.S. Army. Heidi Myers, Deputy Chief Information Officer, Immigration and Customs Enforcement. Dominic Kassad, Acting Chief Information Officer, Department of Veterans Affairs. Rob Carey, President Cloudera, Government Solutions. Scott Anderson, Distinguished Architect and CTO at DHS Horizon Federal. And Nicholas Spies, Chief Federal Technologist at Snowflake. Well, I'm happy to report that the IT modernization conversation is no longer about should I modernize? When should I modernize? Can I afford to modernize? Frankly, we can't afford not to modernize, and I think we've seen a lot of reasons for that. It's more about how do I modernize, and how do I modernize efficiently and effectively, and how do I make sure that uh, I'm doing that, aligning to enabling that very important mission that we're all supporting. Interestingly enough, we have three panel members here with uh, new roles, and uh, our first panel member, Raj, uh, actually has a new role. Certainly uh, new in the CIO position, but not new in the space uh, as a distinguished career across the community and a lot of activity going on there. New leadership over there at uh, the Army, at DOD, and also, of course, uh, a new operating model that we're all working in. Raj, how are we doing over there? Give us a state of the state on IT modernization at U.S. Army. Hey, good morning, Luke. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. So the Army, it's really exciting times in the Army because we are really embarking on a massive digital modernization effort. And I specifically use the word digital modernization and not IT modernization because it's all about changing culture in the Army. And when I say that, it is how do we better, you know, incorporate innovation and taking advantage of the new technologies such as cloud, data, and AI in support of both our business systems in the Army and, and how we run our business, but also how we leverage the same technologies to fight our future wars. So what the Army is embarking on is uh, achieving what I call the digital Army of 2028 and, and how we're gonna fight and win wars in future is leveraging these digital technologies. We are no longer in the era of using, you know, our large tanks and helicopters and, and, and hardware-based weapon system platforms, because as you can already know, we are already in a, in a, in a war right now in, in cyberspace, right? And moving forward, we fully expect that we will be fighting concurrently and simultaneously in what we call multi-domain. And, and that includes land, sea, air, space and cyberspace. So when you have to fight in all five domains concurrently with near peer adversaries, and we're, we're talking you know, countries like China and, and Russia and, and countries that have taken our own technologies that, that we've developed here in this country, such as hypersonics and are, are starting to use them against us. And we have to achieve that kind of deterrence rather quickly. So, so for us, digital modernization is, is more about how we leverage the data um, as the ammunition of a future fight. And, but also the same data is critical for us to reform and modernize our own business operations. So a couple of examples that I can talk to you about is one is we, we are starting with the real basics. We fight using the network. It's all about, you know, how can we get connectivity to our soldier um, at the tactical edge um, and all the way up to our enterprise data centers on cloud and back. And, and when you have to be able to share vast volumes of data, and today, as we know, everything, all our weapon system platforms have sensors on them, and the Internet of Things has made it you know, impossible for us to share large volumes of data in congested network environments. So we're starting with something very basic, which is really modernizing our networks and making sure that they are flat, they're optimized. We're taking it, you know, how do we take advantage of things like 5G? How do we, how do we build in low earth orbit satellites and medium earth orbit satellites and be able to communicate, you know, wherever we are in any area of operations around the world, including areas like indo pacom where today we have limited presence and we have limited network bandwidth to fight and to be able to leverage these new technologies to be able to have full situational understanding um, on, and a common operating picture um, of, of, of the battlefield um, and to achieve mission command. So, so that is an effort, it's a program that we have just initiated called Unified Network Operations. And Unified Network Operations will focus, you know, and, and again, one of the things that we have in the past is we have focused a lot of our effort on how we can optimize and, and, and modernize our, our what, call, what we call our CONUS-based 
um, uh, data centers and our networks, which is everything here in the United States. But the, the pivot that we're making now is to look at our tactical architectures first, because if, if that is our constraint and, and we're always bottlenecked and, and limited by you know, how we fight in, in, in the tactical space, we want to make sure that we start there first and then build our way back up to the enterprise. So no, no, no doubt about that. It's a, you certainly have a, a constellation of uh, complex uh, activities going on there. And I, I would just, it seems to me that the, uh, the heavy metal got you there. Uh, the digital modernization is going to keep you there, right? It seems uh, uh, that, 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 that's, uh, that's the message I'm getting there. Is that a fair statement? Oh, absolutely. And, and so, and it's also about continuous modernization because we know that we can never be in this state where we modernize every 20 years and then say we're done. We, and given how fast technology is changing, what we're building into our culture and into our programs as we acquire them is, is how we can be in persistent modernization. So we're continuously bringing in new technologies and rapidly um, churn them out in support of the warfighter. Fantastic. Well, thanks a lot for that update and uh, congratulations on your new appointment. Speaking of new appointments, Heidi Myers, uh, newly appointed as the Deputy Chief Information Officer, has been in a variety of distinguished uh, senior roles in the Department of Homeland Security. I know you all are on a tear over there. Tell us what's happening at uh, Immigration and Customs Enforcement. Thank you, Luke, and, and thank you for inviting me here today. I wanted to go back, you know, we're coming up on a year with uh, with the pandemic. So I did want to go back a little bit with a story about how we um, supported, you know, the move to full time telework under the pandemic, because I think it really provides a good example of how our IT modernization efforts helped us support that urgent need in just a few days, whereas, uh, you know, in the past, it might have taken weeks or months. So we were able to, to leverage our technology investments and support the, mo the move to full-time telework. Um, we, uh, you know, the challenge was uh, really supporting this effort real time as everyone moved to telework. We, um, we were able to uh, ramp up to over 15,000 users in just three days working from home. Uh, we really focused on, on two areas. We took a look at connectivity and uh, you know, partnering with DHS, we made sure that everyone had reliable connectivity. Uh, we also implemented some alternative connectivity means for uh, certain mission specific needs. Uh, we also of course focused on collaboration and communication. We already had Skype and Teams, so it was really about you know, just getting the information out there, uh, uh, providing training so people knew how to use that. And we also, uh, in a short period of time, implemented a secure video conferencing solution in just about two weeks. So um, we have been uh, establishing other foundational um, work that uh, has supported IT modernization. So we've been redesigning our network, uh, deploying new uh, network hubs in the Eastern and Western US. And this is gonna help us uh, provide better connectivity for our better performance for our applications in the cloud, as well uh, better connectivity for our field offices and also uh, you know, improve our ability to, uh, to connect with other agencies. Very expansive field office out there and very operational, right? You've got uh, folks in uniform, you've got special agents all over the place out there and to put them instantly in a mobile environment is not a, uh, an easy task. So uh, uh, very impressed with that. And thank you for that update. Dominic, uh, tell us about Department of Veterans Affairs. Please tell us for the audience, the massive size of the Veterans Affairs. I'm always just, just in awe about just the, 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 the scope and magnitude of the Department of Veterans Affairs. So give us uh, 30 seconds on that and then tell us what, you know, what's the state of the state out there these days. Uh, thanks, Luke. Yeah, and you're right. Uh, you, when, when I joined VA almost five years ago, you know, I didn't even realize how big it was. Uh, right, before you think, I joined. Uh, you know, there's a couple of hospitals, or right. a couple of this, that big building and headquarters, and no, 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 no. Yeah, well, we're the size of a Fortune 10 uh, company, and, you know, we have over $220 billion annual budget, 
just for IT, we have around a six billion uh, annual budget if you add in some of the COVID funds that we got. But uh, we have uh, over about we have about four hundred thousand uh, government employees, and that's not even uh, uh, considering our contractors. We have uh, we are the largest healthcare provider in the United States, and 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 one of the largest in the world. Um, we're in every state of the union. We, we're all across the U.S. Uh, we're also one of the largest benefits providers and claims processing entities in the United States. You know, we're up there with any major uh, insurance company uh, processing billions of dollars worth of claims every year and paying out benefits checks to our veterans who need them to survive. Uh, so, yeah, it, Luke, you're right. It's it's huge. So, um, you know, trans digital transformation is very important to us because we are so sprawling and large. We need to get to as many veterans as we can. There's 20 million veterans out there right now um, that we could be servicing. Not all of them are in our system and receiving services at the moment, but we'd like to uh, uh, help as many of them as we can. So uh, as you can imagine, with 20 million possible constituents out there, you really got to rely on IT uh, and a digital transformation to reach as many of those as you can and, and be, have, a, have it as a force multiplier. So um, we've been focusing on a digital transformation for the VA over the past couple of years. Uh, we're focusing in five areas, customer service to our veterans, uh, IT modernization through updated software and infrastructure, strategic sourcing is the third, are we buying smartly and using our buying power? The fourth is investing in our IT workforce. Uh, our people uh, who, who support IT in the field are our most important asset. And then finally, achieving a seamless and secure interoperability. Our systems in this sprawling, huge network need to interoperate seamlessly. And we have intense security concerns in terms of our veterans' private information and private health information. So. That's what we've been focused on. And we've made some uh, strides in terms of modernization over the past couple of years. We've certainly done a lot of upgrades to our um, backbone and things like our bandwidth and our telecommunications, uh, which certainly helped us during COVID. Um, we, we've also in, increased and modernized our, our, our end user device footprint. We Oh, during the course of just the last year, we've purchased almost a quarter of a million laptops to upgrade laptops out in the field, uh, more than 100,000 cell phones, uh, because we're really relying on uh, mobile technologies to support telehealth. Uh, we've also uh, moved into the cloud pretty significantly and, and built out our cloud platforms. Um, so that we have scalability and a lot more options uh, when things like COVID or natural disasters happen. We can scale to meet the need and scale to the need of meeting telehealth uh, for our veterans. Um, and then not to mention we're embarked, we've embarked on one of the largest electronic health record modernization uh, programs in the history of healthcare ever. Um, we, you know, we're using a, a 30 to 40 year old homegrown uh, health record system that has worked very well for us. Don't get me wrong, but it's time to modernize to a more a commercial uh, solution so that we can provide cutting edge care. So, yeah, big uh, enterprise and a lot going on at VA. Big scale, uh, 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 big time, and uh, you know you're really moving away from the the pliers and wires and really up the value chain as you digitize these environments, which I'm I'm really pleased to to hear that. I know all the veterans are really pleased to hear that. Rob Carey, let's talk about Cloudera, and uh, first of all, uh, 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 congratulations on your new appointment, and uh, tell us a little bit what one. Uh, uh, glad to see you in, in, in that space. Uh, Rob's got a very distinguished, lengthy, comprehensive background uh, across the community, including a lot of time in federal service. Uh, give us 30 seconds on what Cloudera is first for the audience. And then also let's talk about sort of what you see going on over there these days. So uh, thanks, Luke. So uh, Cloudera, in very short, uh, a very short sentence, Cloudera brings... Um, organizations to the cloud enables your teams to start from I have legacy data to I have analytics running on said data. So I have the ability to bring in tools that connect the systems and apps and data that you have and put it in a place that it can be analyzed and rendered informed decisions from. 
So a reason I came here was it's an age old problem. Madame and I work together at DOD CIO and the amount of data that DOD produces, you can't even fathom the level of data. And so decision makers in the E-ring are trying to render informed decisions based upon what? Upon that data that is very difficult to pinpoint, get, use when you want it. And All so, right, uh, if I may, uh, you threw out a term there. I gotta make sure everyone understands. E-ring, just for the audience that, that might not be in the DOD Pentagon bubble uh, there, sorry. what's E-ring mean? So the E-ring is that outer ring of the Pentagon. People have windows that look out. Uh, and that's actually where the Secretary of Defense, Secretary of the Army, Air Force, uh, Navy sit. So, so those senior civi uh, civilian officials and the chairman of the Joint Chiefs uh, really do rely on the network to provide them timely, accurate decision-making data, which is really in the form of information, right? So think of data is raw, information is in context of the problem that they're trying to solve. So at the end of the day, I took this job because I thought this is a long-standing problem in the federal government to be able to get on top of the legacy data that you have, decide what you need and what you don't need, and then move it forward into a modern compute platform called cloud. Ultimately, that's what uh, everyone is after so that they can make uh, uh, very good informed uh, decisions or, uh, you know, uh, you know, name your mission, right? Now, whether it's a farmer, a small business owner, uh, a veteran, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, glad to see you on board there. Scott, how about over at Verizon Federal? There's a whole bunch of activity going on there. Just absolutely amazed by the folks that were, were, were putting in and, and, and running and have been and still are running all that infrastructure out there and we didn't miss a beat. Everyone moves to COVID and all, uh, everyone moves to remote uh, telework uh, because of COVID and, uh, and those environments didn't miss a beat. So uh, tell us what's happening at Verizon Federal these days. Well, first of all, thanks for having me today, Luke. Um, Verizon Federal has a number of uh, solutions uh, and in fact, most of them came up. Um, we like to look at the world as, as really being in three buckets uh, today, which is different than it was, you know, 10, 15 years ago. The three buckets being the device, the landscape, and then the destination. And we've heard the destination talked about its data centers or cloud. Um, the landscape, that's how you get there. Um, and, uh, you know, 5G was mentioned, right? And there's two flavors of 5G out there right now. Um, there is what everybody calls the nationwide 5G. Uh, and then there's 5G ultra wideband. And the reason that uh, organizations are going to care more about uh, ultra wideband is the fact that coupled with that, Verizon has a number of technologies to do some things that we've talked about and looked, about, looked at from an IT perspective for many years. The first thing is to actually take the data, the compute, and the user, and bring them all together quickly in a solution that we call MEC, or the uh, multi-user edge computing solution. That comes in two flavors. Uh, we actually have a solution that we built in conjunction with AWS, uh, which it's called uh, Wavelink on the AWS side. It allows you to literally push to the edge of the Amazon network and to the edge of the Verizon network in building solutions that users can interoperate with. What does Mech buy you? Well, in the end, what Mech buys you is the ability to deploy five nines applications without having to have the five nines infrastructure. The applications can exist in the Mech world on their own, replicating and moving data. You simply have to change a little bit about how the application works. So in terms of modernization, you know, we're trying to drive those three things. The other thing, and I think probably the biggest, and I'll, I'll uh, block my face here for a moment to, to show the device that's gonna change things. More and more people only carry their cell phone. Um, I can remember uh, many years ago when I first was a consultant, I used to literally carry a laptop and, you know, and a camera and blah, 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 you know, 55,000 things in my bag and, and, you know, tore my shoulder up uh, over the years doing that. The reality is more and more and more people walk away from the office carrying their cell phone. So as we think about modernization, we want to make sure we think about those three buckets, the device, the landscape, and the destination. Uh, the destination is great and important and critical. The landscape is great, important and critical but so is the device. And I'll end with my very favorite line about devices, which is 
if I send you a 10,000 line spreadsheet and I'm asking you to look at line number 9,246 to specifically verify a number and you're on a cell phone, that's painful. That takes just agonizing um, time and effort to do. So instead of being a 30 second job, it becomes a five or six minute job. So we wanna look at as we move down the path to the device being the mobile device, that we modernize in ways that empower users with the device. So we literally can say on the device, hey, you're about to get a 10,000 line spreadsheet and somebody wants you to review it. Can you connect to an external monitor or can you connect to a projector uh, so that you can see this and interoperate with it more effectively? Wow, you're making my head spin Thanks, and uh, uh, very impressive. Oh. I think certainly 5G is a, uh, is going to really unlock a lot of capability and I think we're all looking forward to it. All right, we're gonna take a short break and we'll be back in a moment. You're listening to the Federal Executive Forum on Federal News Network. Welcome back to the Federal Executive Forum on Federal News Network. We're talking about IT modernization. Nicholas, let's go over to you at Snowflake. Uh, you're coming in on audio. You uh, are certainly a, a seasoned pro uh, to this uh, program, and we appreciate that. Tell us what's going on at Snowflake these days. Yeah, Luke, thanks very much, and uh, hello, everyone in the panel. Uh, Snowflake has made some huge changes recently, uh, probably within the last couple of months here. We've started talking about the data cloud at Snowflake. It, as you know from our previous conversations, Luke, Snowflake is sort of a next-generation data platform. We've got all the greatness behind a traditional database, but completely cloud-based and for the most part, cloud agnostic. But we've added to that, allowing folks to not just move to the cloud quickly and efficiently, but also to start sharing data and collaborating on data sets across not just their own business units or not just their own mission sets, but across folks that they collaborate with that are external to their agency or even external to their industry. We're seeing private data partners collaborating on data sets with the government, and we're seeing the government collaborating likewise with private industry and other government agencies. And they're doing all of this securely, safely, without having to move data and do FTP server copies, all of the stuff that we've been trying to avoid for the last 20 years in IT. It's a really exciting time at Snowflake. Uh, and, 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 you know, the, the fact that we now have this uh, introduction of all this advanced technology has allowed a, a capability like Snowflake to, quite frankly, not only exist, but to flourish, right? I and mean, it really is uh, impressive to, to see this type of capability get introduced so quickly. All right, we're gonna roll over oh, absolutely. to- absolutely. Yes, yes. Uh, we're gonna roll over to specific uh, successful IT modernization program project at your agency. Dominic, I'm gonna start with you. Give us an example of one program that you're, uh, that you're working on, have been working on, going to be working on, that you're really proud of, that you'd like to explain and, uh, and, and really highlight for the community here. Sure, uh, thank you, Luke. There's so many to choose from at VA uh, that are going on right now. Um, but uh, as Rob mentioned, uh, we, we worked together in the Pentagon. He was my boss uh, about uh, five or six years ago. And when we'd sit in his office in the in the E-ring when he was the deputy CIO over there, uh, we often found ourselves opining about uh, how to crack the code on the cloud. Uh, so I, I think it's great, Rob's, you know, helping with uh, cloud technology and solutions. And I would say, you know, as we all know, the, the federal government has definitely cracked that code. So I'll talk a little bit about uh, VA's move to the cloud. You know, luckily we set up our, our enterprise cloud platforms um, a couple of years ago, and we've been migrating applications and, and some of our backbone networking support services into the cloud. Um, and it really helped us for COVID. We were, you know, we didn't skip a beat when we were uh, servicing our, uh, you know, about the 9 million veterans that are in our system. And uh, we really leveraged telework uh, or telework and uh, telehealth and and really got our clinicians out there servicing our veterans in in remote areas but uh, you know these these cloud platforms are really essential for us to scale uh, at at capa to capacity uh, to meet the need um, uh, so 
uh, I'll tell you a little bit about what we've done. Uh, we, as of right now, we've moved about 113 applications into the cloud, uh, and we've got 63 in process. Now, VA's got about 700 apps in our inventory, and wow. so that if it, with those numbers, we currently have about 16% of our applications in the cloud. Now, that sounds low, but it's really not because that's just a, the raw numbers. It's not the, the size of the applications. We started off, we went all in, and we moved some of VA's large just applications into the cloud, such as our Office 365 suite, including our enterprise mm -hmm. mail uh, for, again, our 400,000 person workforce, not including contractors. We've moved, we moved our whole identity and access management solution into the cloud. Our, our veterans benefits management service, I told you earlier about the billions of claims we process every year. So we've got claims work going on in the cloud. Um, so on a weighted basis, if you look at the types of applications we moved into the cloud, mm -hmm. um, it, it's it's far heavier reliance uh, and and uh, support from the cloud. Um, our, we also moved uh, many instances of our uh, legacy Vista uh, uh, electronic health record into the cloud, which uh, enables more ease in maintaining and. Uh, um, uh, augmenting those applications uh, because they're more readily available in the cloud and they can scale um, as we need to uh, until we get fully migrated over to the new electronic health record solution that uh, we uh, are working with Cerner on. Um, for VBMS, we've got 2 billion documents in the VA Enterprise Cloud. Two, that's, that's a B, 2 billion documents and that grows daily. Um, so, and we we're also using chat bots that are cloud cloud powered, um, and and setting up websites uh, supporting some of our critical uh, back office business functions. So, um, you know, I would say that's one of the biggest uh, successes we've had in our modernization is our leveraging of our cloud environment. Sounds like a huge success, a uh, a huge effort that you have underway there. And of course, Vista didn't realize that it was uh, you know going on thirty years old being your your uh, your records management uh, uh, system that you're using there that, that that's awesome and you know the cloud play these days uh, it used to be real a real demark right there's the traditional data center and then there's a the cloud and now with this hybrid technology and containerization etc a lot of uh, slippery capability to just kind of slide workloads back and forth if you will which uh, you know is certainly becoming fascinating and, and and much easier for I think everyone to be modernizing. Rob, since you were called out there on the E ring, I might add, uh, why don't we go to you and you can tell us about you know what what do you see? I mean, give us an example of uh, you know a, a an effort that's going on in one of these agencies that you'd like to highlight. Well, I mean, there's there's, there's quite a few that have happened um, that. I think the, the, the end result of this, think of the end result of delivering mission services to constituents, right? So as Dom was talking about, this is about healthcare for veterans. So, you know, you gotta walk, work your way back from that target endpoint to the, then the mechanics of the change, right? I have to enable access, I put it in the cloud. I'm gonna, I'm gonna go from edge to AI so I can then make these informed decisions. But uh, for example, um, Recently, uh, I'll go back into my Navy days before I met Dom, uh, the, the Navy has moved their SAP solutions, right? The four biggest ERPs in the world into the cloud. Why? Very expensive operation to maintain it in a legacy on-prem network, right? Again, uh, of a scale that is unimaginable to most organizations, uh, moving billions of dollars through that system. Right. And so uh, the opportunities that presented themselves were really to enable access, to enable security, to enable analytics on this information that they had, and then to obviously run the business of the Department of the Navy much more efficiently than they had in the past. Um, we are working right now with uh, Postal Service, for example, on moving them to the cloud, moving certain applications and data into the cloud for them, and then moving their systems or moving their uh, framework that we've provided for them into another a modern framework that we have uh, called CDP uh, that enables them to go even faster and more efficiently as they deal with their future. Postal Service being another massive, massive organization massive that organization. Uh, the scope and, and scale and there is just incredible. A commodity, right? It's, it's uh, yeah. realizing back end office systems are the things that help keep them delivering their mail on time. 
Absolutely. Uh, Heidi, how about if we jump up to you? Give us an example. I know there's a whole bunch of different activities that have been going on over there at ICE. Give us an example of one particular program that you'd like to highlight. Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, I think like Dom, I'm going to talk uh, about our cloud presence at ICE. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we started in the commercial cloud, uh, established uh, ICE's presence in the, the Gov cloud, and migrated all of our applications there. We are fully in the cloud and have been for over a year now. Uh, our investigative case management system was uh, DHS's first FISMA high system in the cloud. And uh, we were first of the, uh, the uh, DHS major components to move all of our systems, over 150 systems and uh, dispositioned over 850 pieces of hardware. The cloud has really allowed us to scale more quickly um, and we're able to take advantage of, you know, the state-of-the-art technologies that are there uh, and continue to improve there. We have established our development pipeline there and, uh, you know, doing sec DevOps in the cloud. Um, but uh, we're also focused on data analytics. Uh, Rob talked a little bit about uh, data analytics and um, we've been partnering with our um, Homeland Security Investigations Group uh, in their innovation lab to establish a, a data analytics environment that um, allows analysts to quickly analyze large amounts of data. We're also setting up uh, a, a more dynamic data environment that allows uh, data scientists to uh, quickly ingest data on the fly and, um, and perform analytics uh, in, in a more dynamic environment. Um, we are using the cloud just for more pilot projects mm -hmm. uh, that has, uh, you know, since we can um, spin up servers pretty quickly, right. we're able to, you know, run pilots, uh, test out a product's capability, test out the interoperability, and this also really helps us justify funding for new projects if we can, you know, demonstrate tangible benefits uh, in advance. A proof of concept always really important in data analytics and any investigative organization. So key, right, uh, to be able to do that. This and you know, just any type of uh, environment where you can get that time to market capability, always uh, super important. Uh, Scott, let's talk about uh, an example at Verizon, what's going on there in regards to uh, uh, a specific program that you'd like to highlight uh, across uh, any part of the federal market, or quite frankly, the uh, private sector market. Well, I, I, first of all, again, thank you. A uh, couple of things. I mean, let's start off with the easy button. A uh, lot of organizations uh, in, oh, I don't know, say last March, uh, had a significant change in their world. Um, we did, Verizon did, most companies, most government agencies did um, as workers went home for the pandemic. What that really did uh, for most organizations is it really changed their collaboration flow. Um, now all of a sudden workers are connecting to the office via VPN, then connecting to a cloud-based collaboration service and then back to, the, to uh, the network and then back out you know, via the cable modem or the BIOS or whatever other connection you want to have. So routing that traffic and, and deploying application intelligence is critical. And we actually worked with a large organization. Um, their pain point was their collaboration system was choking the network. It really was causing them a lot of pain. Uh, what we did is we actually helped them using software-defined networking uh, to create an on-the-fly reroutable network so that as critical information began to flow through the network via the collaboration infrastructure, uh, we were able uh, to support that. We were able to empower the organization uh, without stepping all over the network. Uh, and that's another piece of the puzzle as we go forward and head down this path of modernization. Um, and so, you know, we've got this this IP we've built now, how can we help you, you know, rewrite your collaboration platform? But that actually also applies to virtually any other application an organization may have, um, because there are a number of ways uh, that, that the organization can better utilize the network as a solution. Um, I remember probably about a year ago, right as the, uh, the work from home uh, reality started, you know, we were looking at uh, a customer's uh, data flow um, they had literally 
about 85% of the organization had moved from on-premise uh, collaboration to cloud collaboration. Um, and in that process, um, they realized that they had actually flipped their network flow. Um, they adopted and embraced uh, a VoIP solution, and suddenly the voice over IP traffic was on their network. Uh, and that's why Verizon began to offer what we call SIP trunking. Well, actually, we've offered it for a long time. Uh, but it allows us to take that voice traffic, that VoIP traffic, and put it on our network, the Verizon network, versus your network. Uh, so instead of taking all that additional traffic, uh, we help m companies uh, recreate their networks by taking their VoIP traffic, putting it on the Verizon network, and reducing that load on their network. That's a right, couple of it, examples of right, ways right. modernization work. 100% as that work, you know, flow, that work pattern changes, the uh, the workflow changes, right, and into a, a different type of dynamic. And quite frankly, that happened almost instantaneously across the planet Earth. I mean, when you think about it, it it's, it's absolutely incredible. Raj, how about over at U.S. Army? You talked about, gave us the top line on several different activities that are going on. Why don't you grab one of those or, or some another one and, and, and give us an example of an activity that you have going on over there that you'd like to highlight for us. Yeah, no, absolutely. So, you know, I'll take one that's really soldier facing, right? Because at the end of the day- There the you go, we like our, that. The army fights with the soldiers that, you know, soldiers are a weapon system. So um, I'm sure you all have seen this, but the army is embarking on a journey to kind of upskill and reskill our entire workforce. And that includes soldiers and civilians and to get them to be more tech savvy in future, right? And, and if we are gonna be serious about digital modernization and we're gonna use data to fight our future fight, we gotta make sure that we are tech savvy um, across the board, not just in certain areas, not just the IT workforce, but the entire workforce. So one of the programs that the, um, the Sergeant Major of the Army and the Chief of Staff uh, initiated a couple, you know, a couple of years ago is a modernization of the Army's uh, tuition assistance and credentialing assistance platform. So the Army pays out probably over $600 million in tuition assistance to soldiers, cadets, and army civilians so they can take college courses and, and degrees if they don't have one already or can go after commercial certifications like PMP and CISSP and Agile and, Agile and things like that. And so the Army had a 15-year-old system called Go Army Ed. Uh, it was a highly customized PeopleSoft system that had you know, essentially been clued together over the years and band-aided and, and running in a mainframe system for many years and really wasn't meeting the purpose uh, and the intent. It had gotten so inflexible and, and really not serving the needs of um, the soldiers. So the Army embarked on a modernization platform that essentially rebuilt the new system from scratch in, in just under a year. Uh, and if you compare the sophistication of the technology that went into it and the capabilities compared to legacy, way more capabilities, you know, and delivered in far less time and a fraction of the cost, right? And and that is only possible by leveraging, you know, things like cloud native architectures, uh, leveraging platforms. So even though these were customized processes, if we did not want to make sure we didn't, we want to make sure we weren't customizing a cost product. So we went with a platform, a low code, no code platform approach to implementation. Um, but we also took a human centered design approach, right? That is all about digital modernization is how do you make sure it's human centered and putting the soldier first, right? So it wasn't policy and, and regulations that, that drove the requirements for the system. We brought real users in on the very first day and sat with them to understand how they would use the system, how they were using, you know, their mobile devices and apps to access it and how easy could we make it for them and everything else had to be transparent to the user. And so we went from a system that had 150 videos and probably 300 plus user manuals uh, teaching how users how to use to one that is so intuitive today that just like any other app on the app store, they can go in now and then enroll for college courses and, and set up the degree plans and get, get, get approvals all within minutes um, and, and make that happen so easily for them. And while at the same time, you know, we also saved about 20 to $25 million a year by divesting off and sunsetting a, a really ancient legacy system. And so we're now modernizing for the future because we, are, we now have a cloud native system that we can continue to modernize and in, incorporate new technologies into it, but most importantly, serving the needs of the soldier. Boy, that's a win, win, win. And I love the idea that we're starting with the, uh, the soldier first. All right, we're going to take a short break and we'll be back in a moment. You're listening to the Federal Executive Forum on Federal News Network. 
Welcome back to the Federal Executive Forum on Federal News Network. We're talking about IT modernization. And I was asking the, uh, the guest about a specific program they'd like to highlight. Nicholas, let me uh, throw it over to you at Snowflake. Yeah, thanks, Luke. Um, you know, the one that's kind of closest to my heart, Snowflake's got a lot of great IT modernization stories, but probably the, the one I like the most at the moment are advances we're making in healthcare. And it's not just customer facing healthcare or patient facing healthcare, it's also on general US healthcare. Uh, for example, COVID-19 uh, has been a, a huge area where Snowflake has done everything that we can to contribute to research and development of the vaccines. But most importantly, we've, we've been working with the state of California to be their COVID-19 dashboard provider. Mm -hmm. All the data that goes into California for their COVID-19 dashboard for the governor, uh, for the individual regions inside of the state, and also for private citizens. Um, and our efforts there have been so successful, California posted their COVID data uh, onto our data marketplace, which is like an app store for data sets, uh, so that private citizens and researchers can access that data. It's all anonymized, of course, uh, and very, very safe. But uh, that data was pushed up there so that folks could research that data and look into it. And that's, you know, that's really why I like focusing on solutions like that. I, I go back to what the good doctor said a few minutes ago, about uh, taking talent down to the lowest person and how do we get everybody involved in this, talking about making soldiers a little more data focused. Um, we can't get there in IT modernization without modernizing our people as well. It's something that Snowflake sees a lot of, teaching folks how to use those new architectures and the benefits of cloud and not just having uh, somebody else's computer run their software. It's, it's a huge thing to consider uh, and Snowflake has seen a lot of success when we get folks involved at the lower levels because uh, again, it's a, it's a database. It doesn't need to be scary. Great example there. I'm going to roll it over to uh, top priorities. Give me two, Dominic, Department of Veterans Affairs. You got a lot of stuff going on over there. Give, me, give, me, give us your top two priorities for the year. Yeah, hey, a lot of priorities, but uh, I got, I'll focus on uh, one or two. The, the, the secretary, our new secretary, Dennis McDonough, one of his top priorities that he mentioned during his uh, testimony on the Hill was fighting the pandemic. Um, and many of you might know, VA has what we call a fourth mission, and that is to be the backup healthcare system for the United States um, if our hospitals are overwhelmed. So that, that's a big responsibility. So uh, one of our priorities in helping with that is the use of, um, uh, as I mentioned earlier, telehealth. So uh, I'll focus a little bit on leveraging mobile devices. Uh, what we, we've always had the ability to do, or we've had for many years the ability to do telehealth, but there was always this apprehension and resistance on behalf of both the clinicians, the doctors, and the patients to do this remotely. But COVID sort of forced our hand on that, and it really showed the clinicians and the patients the power of telehealth and the ability to leverage mobile devices to provide a really robust and rich uh, interaction uh, between a patient and a care provider. So, uh, you know, as I've mentioned, we've really beefed up our numbers on mobile devices um, and uh, the, the applications that run on them so that we can um, ha have this, this rich environment. What we'd like to do is uh, pair that with an increase in wearables. Those are the devices that people wear that feed uh, health information right. like um, uh, um, uh, uh, heart rate, uh, information about diabetes care, um, uh, uh, blood pressure, things like that, that we can integrate into this and make it even a more rich, you know, using things like Apple Watches and these digital scales that are Bluetooth enabled, you know, it'll really give that continuity of care to doctors. And, and, and if I had to mention a, a second one, I'll mention uh, the, the leveraging of data. Uh, as was mentioned earlier by uh, uh, Rob and Heidi, you know, there's, there's vast treasure troves of data out there in government. So we're going to be focusing on um, uh, things that we can do to really get that data working for our veterans. Sounds fantastic. Heidi, top priority for this year for you all over at uh, Immigration and Customs Enforcement. I would say one of our top priorities is accelerating delivery. So, you know, speed to market is really important for us. We're looking at our processes, our tools, our contracts. We want to make sure that our programs understand our capabilities and have an, an efficient intake process for new requirements. We're really setting up a, a center of excellence for um, 
for platform as a service and uh, you know low code no code capabilities to ensure that uh, we can give you know applications get them out there quickly but then also provide customizable support when we when um, users need it. Uh, a, a recent example was uh, we needed a new tracking mechanism um, for you know, some of the new administration's priorities. And we were able to put together a, a form in um, just a few days and it was ready for production in two weeks. Uh, we're making sure that we have fully ATO'd environments and that they meet privacy requirements and you know, I, I know that sometimes there are going to be needs for custom development, but we want to make sure we have uh, we give the capabilities to get the the business processes and the mission critical functions out there quickly. Sure, time to market always really important. Raj, number one priority for you at the Army as you enter on service there. Yeah, I'd say the the biggest one that we're looking at now is kind of modernizing our ERP system. So the Army has four ERP systems for logistics, financial management, and real property management. And uh, as you all probably tracking, you know, SAP that's been kind of the leader in the market for almost 40 years now, you know, the core products and the versions that, you know, that they have supported over the last few years are now really at end of life. And the Army is staring at um, you know, how do we modernize these ERP systems, leveraging lessons learned from the past? And what should that future architecture need to look like? Do we still need an ERP system moving forward? And um, and 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 sure, you know, we all have heard horror stories about ERP systems not achieving return on investment, but yet it's kind of like a necessary evil, you know, to run your enterprise. And we are really taking a hard look at, you know, how do we want to, you know, we had to redo this all over, and which is where we are now. What would that look like? And does it need to include a core ERP, or should it just be, you know, a trans transactional system with microservices and workflows that that run the enterprise how customize it how customized should it be does it need to be customized and if you if you try to get to out of the box processes do you lose your you know competitive advantage or the inability to execute your mission because you're now forced to do something that's an uh, that's an out of the box process and so we're we are heavily investing now in a in a massive business process reengineering effort that's looking at how we do business and what, how unique is it in the Army compared to our, our commercial partners uh, in the same space when it comes to logistics and supply chain management and also looking at our policies? Because if we continue to be constrained by antique policies that force us to do things in a certain way, uh, it doesn't matter how great you are in reengineering your process, you're always constrained by policy. So we're looking at policies, processes, and the technology to be able to modernize our ERP into the future so that we have um, um, a lower total cost of ownership uh, for our ERP systems moving forward. And I think that's fair. You know, this tectonic shift in uh, the, uh, the, the pace of technology change now uh, you need to continue to re-examine that and make sure that something you thought about in the journey you started, maybe an IT modernization journey, perhaps uh, five years ago, is still the right thing to do, uh, being that you know the, the technology has changed considerably. Well, this is a fantastic conversation. We are going to uh, talk about the future, and I'm going to ask Nick to start us off. And uh, you know, just uh, tell us what it looks like in a couple of years. What, what's sort of coming out of the Petri dish at Snowflake and uh, what can we expect in a couple of years? Well, so I've got my crystal ball out, Luke. Um, so I think, you know, the big move to cloud isn't gonna slow down. In fact, that inertia is gonna get, I think a, a whole lot bigger, a whole lot greater, uh, especially after COVID as we go sort of into the next phase of the, of the pandemic and, and get a little bit more freedom. We're not gonna see a huge transition back to the way things were. We're gonna keep moving forward. One thing we've seen out of COVID is that agencies and, and uh, between not just local government, but local and federal have become much better about collaboration and data sharing. And we see that trend continuing. There will be more public facing data sets and honestly more private data sets that uh, government agencies want to share with each other, but not necessarily with the public and maybe not with the same level of granularity. Uh, we'll see more law enforcement, uh, homeland security data sets being shared with DOJ. We'll see a lot of medical research and medical data sets, HR data sets, weather, you name it. Uh, there's no limit in sight for what data sharing on the Snowflake data platform is going to bring. Fantastic. And we certainly look forward to that. Scott, how about at Verizon? You talked about 5G 
uh, when that gets fully unlocked and enabled, you know, what is that? What is that? Uh, what does it look like? What does the world look like in a fully enabled 5G, et cetera? Well, well, first of all, we'll be able to deploy a, a brand new system called the uh, anti fiber seeking backhoe system um, yeah. where, you know, there's a jolt of electricity that pops the guy out of the seat and stops the engine. Um, mm -hmm. No, that's a, that's a dream, right? That's not going to really happen. So what does 5G look like? Well, first of all, 5G does some, I mean, 5G changes absolutely nothing for application developers. Uh, application developers don't build latency into apps. Latency comes from the destination and, and the landscape of the solution, right? There's no intent. You don't see developers going, I'm going to make this app go ahead and hold up for 35 milliseconds just to make the user nervous. Um, they just, they don't do that. Developers build solutions to help users effectively use what they want to do. Um, the reality of the development world, if you think about it, Steve Jobs threw the entire world on its ear in 2007 when he changed software. Uh, software before 2007, you know, it was 40, 50, 60 bucks for a piece of software. Um, you know, you took the full functionality of that software. You know, Jobs opened the Apple Store. You got these bite-sized apps. Um, that's what 5G is going to empower even more, where less and less and less reliance on um uh, the, the device in your pocket and more reliance on the cloud, more reliance on the ability to share the processing because you're not going to have latency. You're not going to have that need to do as much locally because ultimately with that new world, you're going to be able to quickly get that data. Um, best case example, um, I was in the uh, Mall of America uh, before well, right after the Mall of America was 5G lit, right after um, the first COVID lockdown was loosened a little bit in D.C., I was in the Mall of America, and um, I had to upload something um, from my cell phone, actually from my laptop, using my cell phone as a hotspot. I had to upload something. It was a, a very large file, almost uh, almost a, a terabyte in size. Um, using the 5G ultra-wide band, uh, currently available in the Mall of America, sitting on a bench, you know, looking at the Capitol building, I was able to upload that, I think it was like 980 or 960 gig uh, in less than five minutes. Um, I think wow, that's I mean, the future. That's, that's remarkable. Better than Wi-Fi speed anywhere. Rob Carey, how about at Cloudera? What's it look like? What, what are you seeing around the corner there as you uh, enter into that environment over there? So, you know, I see, I see hybrid cloud uh, maybe gravitating more towards all cloud. Um, you know, we, we need to be sorting. I, I see us over the next couple of years sorting the data wheat from the data chaff, you know, ergo legacy from uh, what we're using today. I see the distributed workforce being, uh, as a couple of folks have said, the, the way of the future. So I'm accessing data and applications from wherever I happen to be. Uh, which does require the cloud. So now I see uh, moving uh, cloud enablement from a somewhat difficult process to a rote process, because in my mind, it is still not a rote process per se. So I think in the next couple of years, we will enable the ease of transition into cloud. Um, and then doing that allows me to then start analyzing my data, the edge to AI kind of uh, analysis and, and enable really accelerated informed decision-making by those who need it. So I think this is really just making us better at any mission we're doing, whether it's Dom's, or whether it's Raj's, you know, the access to that data by who needs it and then be able to query it in near real time is gonna help us get better at our mission. Sounds like uh, based on what Verizon just said, real time, which is fantastic and uh, appreciate that. And again, congratulations on the new appointment, Dominic. Uh, what's it look like for the veterans? You gave us a little, uh, a little uh, intro into uh, what's going on there as far as telehealth. What, what's it going to look like in two to three years? What, what's, uh, what's the thinking going on in the head shed over there? Yeah, so, um, you know, the, the future is clear for us. The, you know, this, this digital transformation we all embarked on, this isn't a nice to have kind of thing. It's a need to have. I mean, we've shown for businesses or government services to survive, we need to have a strong digital presence. There's not going to be any going back from the enhanced remote presence we're seeing through all of our organizations where there was apprehension and and a pause before going to telework, telehealth, telehearings, 
telecounseling, things like that. And it, we're, you know, we're all in. And now that people see the power of it and uh, are getting used to it and like it, uh, you know, there's uh, we not only see us not going back, but we see the demand increasing. So we're going to continue to invest in our uh, mobile technologies, as I mentioned, and our infrastructure that supports a remote presence. Uh, in terms of data, uh, we really uh, want to start in implementing some industry-leading data analysis and machine learning tools to help our our researchers at VA and our data scientists make new healthcare discoveries and streamline our VA operations. And like I said earlier, get that data working for the veterans. We have their data. We're the stewards of their data. If we can get that working for them, so it makes their lives better, uh, then we're in good shape. Um, we, we're going to focus on security. Uh, we are working on integrating and embedding automated security functions into our DevSecOps processes and our agile development processes. So it's built in there truly, uh, not just uh, uh, bolted on at the end. Uh, we're also looking at automation technologies such, such as RP, robotic process automation and RPA to help us with our claims processing. You know, if you can save 10 seconds on processing a claim when you're processing billions of them a year, that's a huge uh, muscle movement. So uh, we really want to look at RPA. And then I'll just finally, I'll mention the use of APIs. Um, APIs is a tool to bridge um, our veterans with their data and allow, you know, an ecosystem of, of uh, independent developers to develop APIs, application programming interfaces that will allow veterans to tap into their data. We really see a future there. And I love the idea of this uh, veterans um, uh, confidence in this new capability and, and really uh, a, a completely reimagination of the user experience. I think that's fantastic. Heidi, what it does, uh, you know, if I'm an agent graduating out of the academy in a couple of years, I'm going to get issued a, a firearm. I'm going to get issued a badge. Am I going to get issued a laptop too? I mean, what does it look like in the future? Uh, for ICE, it's any device anywhere. So, you know, we've developed a mobility roadmap that will ensure transparency across all operating environments from, you know, a, from a, a tablet to the desktop to the device, the mobile phone. And, you know, ensuring that no matter where uh, the agent is in the field, in his government vehicle, in the office, at home, that he has the same user experience across all of those capabilities making sure there are apps that they can simply and securely do their jobs as well, uh, that we have the network, the hardware, the infrastructure in place, the, the audio, uh, video, and collaboration tools across all environments. And um, we actually have a, a workplace transformation initiative within ICE that's focused on uh, the workplace of the future, whether it be in the office or at home, and uh, establishing, you know, flexible spaces. We're working with our um, our uh, uh, facilities team as well as our human resources to make sure that we have that um, that you know remote capability as well as coming in the office and that they have the tools they need. Uh, we we're installing reservation systems. Um, we you know make sure that they have Wi-Fi. Uh, we're uh, getting uh, implementing e-fax. We do still do faxing, so mm -hmm. we're supporting that as well. Making sure they have the tablets they need. Uh, we're piloting a new um, audio video conferencing capability that will work across environments, across the desktop, the phone, uh, the, the, the workstation, the conference room. And we're also piloting a, a zero trust solution because we know that security is going to be key as well, whether or not, um, you know, whether you're mobile or in a dispersed environment. Complete ubiquitous environment based on a zero trust architecture. I love it. Thank you very much. Raj, how about at U.S. Army? Uh, you know, what's, a, what's the experience for that soldier in a couple of three years? Yeah, I think there's, there's one takeaway from this panel. I think it's all about the data. Right. I, I think, you know, I think it's very clear when we look at each of the case studies and the and the implementations underway. Uh, I heard the word data more than I heard technology and, and anything else. And so for the army, it's the same thing. It's it's, you know, it's decision making at the speed of war. Uh, and it's it's how well we're able to leverage data at Echelon, right, all the way from soldier being a sensor 
right? And being able to collect data, process data, and be able to send it back to the enterprise, you know, through, you know, uh, disconnected and, you know, highly latent networks. And it's about how we establish data standards for interoperability, because when we have to fight, we're fighting not just with our sister partners and our joint partners in the DoD, but it's also with our allied nations. And, and every time you, know, you bring on an additional set of players um, into that, you know, the complexity of data and, and your integration and interoperability is now an order of magnitude more complex. And, and the only way you're going to address that is by leveraging AI, right? So we need AI to augment decision making. This certainly cannot be one that where we can have human beings pull through terabytes of data, um, you know, when, when we are milliseconds away, you know, um, uh, fighting off hyper, hy uh, hypersonic, um, you know, missiles and fire coming at us. And, and so, so AI is going to be critical. And, um, and the Army is well on its way through our Project Convergence uh, pilot programs validating these technologies. And we're confident over the next few years, between now and 2028, we will have a fully integrated system of capabilities that leverages cloud data and AI as our warfighting platform. And I know that'll be uh, done very thoughtfully and carefully. And uh, we look forward to that. Uh, Heidi and Raj both, I wanted to congratulate you on your new appointments there. And uh, we're gonna have to wrap it up here. So I want to thank all of you for uh, taking the time from your busy schedules to join us for this program. I'd like to thank our sponsors for supporting us on the show. I'd like to thank the good people here at Federal News Network that make our program so successful and, and enjoyable. And most of all, I'd like to thank you, the listening audience out there that tune into this program every month. You're listening to the Federal Executive Forum, part of the Federal News Network. <laughs>